The presenting sponsor for On Education is Schoology. Schoology's passion lies in helping instructors and students have the best education experience possible. Schoology is a collaborative, student-focused, and faculty-centered learning management system. Students love Schoology because it gives them 24-7 access to course materials, real-time feedback from their instructors, and easy-to-use collaborative tools. Teachers love the streamlined workflow, integrated apps such as Google and Microsoft tools, and the ability to view evidence of student learning for making instructional decisions. To learn more about what is possible with Schoology, simply visit Schoology.com. Am I losing my mind is really the question here. Probably. Welcome to On Education. I'm Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Irvin. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We will discuss why 21st century skills matter, differentiating instruction without losing your mind, the potential strike this week by Denver teachers. And our guest this week is co-author of the book, Fact versus Fiction, Jennifer Lagarde. So let me tell you a story. I'm, I'm in the car and I'm driving and Cheryl's, I, I mean, Cheryl's a teacher. We're both teachers. So we, we talk, you know, shop quite a bit, sure. um, you know, in the car and generally just anytime. Um, and I'm saying she's talking about a, a music project that she's working on with her kindergarten kids. And she's bringing like a bunch of our, you know, stuff like our extra our empty like soup cans and bottles for kids to like bang on. And I think we were the reason why we started talking about is because she's looking at like these big thick milkshake straws that oh, yeah. she wants to buy and then bring um, to use as like drumsticks or whatever. Um, and you can also like, I guess, cut them at different lengths and they make different sounds and, you know, kindergarten stuff. Yeah. It's cool. Um, cool. But what I was, uh, I said to her, I said, wouldn't it be cool? You, you have iPads. Wouldn't it be cool to download some sort of a soundboard app? You know what I'm talking about? The ones where you, like DJs have, where you press yeah. the, the squares and different sounds come out. Yeah, love um, those. But you yeah. can program those things to make whatever sound you want. You record a sound and then it makes it. I said, wouldn't it be cool to find a soundboard app? You can program it to play different sounds and get the kids to record, you know, whatever sounds they want. And then they can they can use those um, to, to make music. Yeah. Swear to God, man, scrolling through <laughs> Twitter this morning, there's a friggin ad for a soundboard app in my Twitter feed. <laughs> They're and listening. <laughs> are they? Like, I'm legitimately interested in knowing. Like, I mean, we know that Siri, like, when you say, I don't want to... Yeah, don't go off. I, <laughs> I'm looking over at my phone. I don't want to say the wrong thing. But you know, when you say those words that... um you know it, the the automated things come up we have yeah. google home if i say hey google i i know that google's listening and and whatever i mean i don't know i don't know anymore because pretty creepy, i don't know huh? why i don't know why that ad would be in my feed otherwise under uh, under exactly. under a normal circumstance i'm not a freaking dj guys yeah. <laughs> i mean i should be you can mix it <laughs> I could. I, I think. I think we should start a band. In fact, <laughs> but that's a whole other. That's, that's a whole, whole other, other discussion. Yes, I. I've heard so many stories like that, of a variety of different topics, from Facebook ads to Twitter ads or whatever else it might be, where you were just having a conversation. You never actually even typed anything. That's the freaky part. Is uh-huh. it, if we type something into a social media site, then we have to understand that it's there's some artificial intelligence going on there that's really what we're doing and it's going to target ads at us. But when we're speaking in our own homes, is it really scary as hell, man? Is it really private or is it not really private? I mean, so we're, we're trading our automated grocery list creation and, and real time weather for, um, you know, maybe them listening to us, I don't know, man, (laughs) but it was like, I was like, are you serious? I, I, I don't know how that would have gotten on there. The real otherwise. question is, was that the right uh, 
app. app? I don't know. <laughs> did I you buy the app? It. To be it... honest, it scared the hell out of me so much that the first thing I did was go onto the damn outline and write it out because I was like, what's happening here? I need to talk about this. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I, I didn't even download the app. I just went onto Google Docs and started typing in the outline that, <laughs> that this happened. I, I mean, it was a mess. Um, so anyways, that's my story for today. Um, <laughs> it's super creepy, man. Creep um, fast. <laughs> right. Um, lots of cool articles this week and lots of things, lots of things going on. Um, we came across an article in Ed Surge. Um, it's 2019. So why do 21st century skills still matter? I mean, I think the question answers itself a little bit for us anyways. What are your thoughts on this? I, I, Well, I mean, the article itself says uh, it's something about that some educators have grown weary of the term 21st century learning. Um, Sure, okay. And so I I don't know if that means that that they don't believe that it's it's essential to go ahead and continue to focus on those types of skills. And I think 21st century is now, I mean, obviously, you know. We're almost 20 years into the 21st century. Exactly. And so – it's it's a weird term, but we all know at least have a an idea of what it means. You know the four C's and and other and other types of skills that yeah. we consider them to be twenty first century skills. I, I I think maybe teachers get burned out by terms. Do you know what I mean? After mm-hmm. five or plus years of people hearing this, then they go, okay, we get it. So let's just move on. But the so, article explains, yeah, we can't move on because this is. This is just emerging and we need to continue to push these types of things in schools because really we haven't, we're barely at the surface of it in public education. I think uh, we're barely scratching the surface of being able to implement these things and have them be part of the things that we really focus on, you know, versus standardized skills. We're 20 years, almost 20 years into the 21st century and we're still teaching like it's 1980. Yes. And actually that fits with that other article that we were reading as far as what will people look like? What will people, you know, what will we do, you know, 30, 40 years from now? And when we look back at this time, will we go, my goodness, you guys were still teaching like it was 19, what what do you say, Mike, like 1920s, 30s, you know, where we're, we're still doing the exact same things that were part of, and there was a historical reason, as you've stated before, that there's a historical reason why we did things a certain way. We taught a certain way uh, in rows, uh, the same way, uh, you know, and, and, but those things don't exist anymore, but we continue to do it. You know, the agrarian well, model, the calendar that right, you talked yeah. to me about before, uh, all of those things, there was a reason why it started, but why do we continue to do it? It's just so it, it's so ridiculous, but we're so ingrained in it. And it, all of these things kind of work together. All of the articles as we kind of fit this mold of we've done it this way in the past. Why don't we just continue to do it? I don't know. It's just, it's so frustrating. I mean, our entire education system, both in the United States and Canada, is based on the Prussian education system. And I don't think Prussia existed in the 20th century, let alone the 21st century. I know. <laughs> Most people don't even know what that is. They're like, right. Prussia? And, and the, Russia? Agrarian, no, no. <laughs> the, the agrarian frigging calendar is what we base our school year on so that our ki- so Isaac can go – you know, cut corn down in the friggin' field. I don't think Isaac's seen a cornfield for God's sakes, let alone, you know, going and cutting, cutting one he down. Needs to go out and help with the harvest like us that he we're doing to, in our game. Dude, he needs to get his damn boots on and get out there and cut some corn. He needs to Cause I mean, he's off. He's farm. not in school. That's I guess what you're supposed to be doing when you're not in school in August is cutting the corn down. So let's get our asses out there and cut some corn. It, it's amazing. All of the, how all of this is all connected though. Mike, uh, the article that, you know, we were going to bring up, I guess we're just mishmashing them together now, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, there's an article about grading and, and the grading, the systems of grading, again, were invented with a purpose in mind a long time ago, hundred years ago, maybe, you know, around that time. And it's like, are we still living in that same time period? No. Have we learned many more things about what are important? You know, for example, again, going back to this four C's, should we kind of be like, okay, it is important to read and write and we need to make sure we know some mathematical skills, 
But what else do we need to know in order for us to be highly functioning members of our society? Well, we figured out, hey, there's these things, 21st century skills that companies are demanding that their employees have. Well, maybe we should be teaching those things. Well, how do we go about doing that? Well, there's a variety of different things that people are doing. But the number one thing, though, is we don't even... Uh, we don't have an emphasis enough that where we're like, hey, we're embedding this in everything. It's the law. We're doing this because it's that important to us. We're like, eh, think about how you go about doing this. You know, yeah. maybe you'll do it on on one day a week. Try that creativity thing. Try that collaboration thing, you know, in your classes yeah. versus going, uh, this is the way we teach now because it's important that we've learned that this is the what we should be doing moving forward. Well, and this is why, I mean, I rail about hiring practices and stuff like that, too, is because uh, you have teachers that literally sit there and open the same friggin day book that they've had for 20 years and just copy the the lesson plans Super and stuff from one year to another. And literally they have they have the, the what do they call them? Black line masters, the master, ma- the master <laughs> sheets for the for the, yeah. the friggin worksheets. Right. And they uh, literally just yes. they do all of their photocopying for their worksheets and on on Monday or Friday afternoon. And and, and they just it's like brainless. You don't have to do anything. If you so, if you already know what you're going to teach four weeks from now on a Wednesday, that's right. not a good thing. It isn't. Well, it means that you're not even paying attention to what's actually currently happening with your set of students that are sitting down in your seats in your class. Instead, you're just saying, hey, for efficiency's sake, I'm just going to do the exact same thing I did every other year on this exact same day. Right. That <laughs> like, That's bad. I mean, I, I had a unit plan. Everyone has to have like plans sure, and ideas, right? And, yep. and like and I knew when my objectives, I yes. knew when my photography unit would generally start and generally end, but things change in the middle. And, and, and I mean, listen, different, differentiating instruction is hard and um, it's, it's, it is really easy actually I think to lose your mind doing it potentially sure. it's not easy it's but it is the right thing to do and listen if if you wanted a, an easy job don't be a teacher sorry <laughs> <laughs> that's so true it, if, it is I mean, not if you were looking job. if you were looking for an easy job I, I do know some cornfields that need you know clearing well not right now and not right now here i don't but, know if that's I an mean, easy job but no it's I, not but, actually but, but i can I, do that job yeah, to save my life exactly but but there are some jobs where you don't have to uh just be so willing to be changed to your audience and right. that's really what it is it's it's a surprise every single day you have to adapt sorry not change adapt to your uh your students and because they're your customers. You have to mold whatever you're doing to fit them. And that could be basically from lesson to lesson throughout the year as you do that. And then, of course, from year to year, as we went in the summers, and you know this, that we would go back and reflect and then revamp things that we were doing, learn about more things, and then continue to push the envelope to make sure that we were that we were really uh, doing a good job as far as pushing ourselves and then making sure that we reach their students, whether it be about tech or just teaching skills, whatever it might be uh, that you were trying to work on as far as in your classes. So I don't know if there's an answer to whether we should continue to use grading and in and, and what way, shape or form that needs to take. Obviously it needs to be kind of revamped and we're actually going to talk about outdated models and stuff in, in the next segment as well. Yeah. So so we can continue to have that conversation. Uh, We did want to talk about the Denver. uh, There's there's situations going on in Colorado with teachers. Um, A a lot of interesting situations. Uh, First, let's talk, uh, Glenn, and you can talk about this a little bit. The uh, uh, Denver teachers uh, potentially going uh, to have a strike over merit pay. So they're going to this is Sunday we're recording and they said that they're set to strike. Uh, this is basically tomorrow. Uh, and it's basically over merit pay or performance pay. And if you're not aware of that, or if that doesn't happen in your States or hasn't made it to, to your areas, basically what it is, is, is uh, st- teachers get a specific, uh, pay, uh, on a, let's say a salary schedule. 
And then you can make above and beyond that by fulfilling whatever it is that they consider to be the the merit, you know, the that you achieved certain things. And unfortunately, <laughs> this is always connected, almost always connected to standardized tests. I was going to say grades, right? So yeah. So it's what it is, is basically a high stakes test that the students take. And then if the students perform, the teacher gets paid. Now, you're not right. comparing students to themselves either, Mike, right. which was just disgusting. So you're not comparing Glenn Irvin in fifth grade to Glenn Irvin in sixth grade and how much I grew between the two things and then saying, hey, if your students show a growth of, of a certain percentage, then yes, you fulfilled your merit pay, which even that just is not a good idea. But at least that would be more valid than what they're doing is comparing a sixth grader this year to a, a sixth grader from the past year. And then how much growth between those two completely different people and different right. classes. It's It's so ridiculous, but Yet again, just like everything else that we talk about, uh, we Mm -hmm. continue to do it. And in this case, this merit pay is kind of what keeps like if you didn't earn that extra pay, Mike, you're not even you're not basically getting that raise. So it's a way of kind of holding back a raise and and then and then being able to say, nope, you didn't earn it. So you just get the standard pay. You don't get this, you know, the, the, the raise that you deserve. So merit pay. Uh, performance pay, it might, it sounds like one of those awesome ideas when someone explains it to you, you know, and gives you the pitch, you're like, Hey, that, that could be good. But when you see it and you see the examples of what's happened in our different States, even Obama was for it. You remember that like race to the top, uh, all those types of things, Arnie Duncan, huge uh, proponent of these types of things. It basically is performance pay. It sounds amazing. And it sounds like a, uh, possibly a thing to be able to have teachers grow but there's just so many things wrong with them and we haven't figured out a way to make it work the right way well the problem is what it's tied to right i mean performance pay or merit pay tied to things like coaching might be a good idea Uh, i don't know um tied to um you know, uh, running clubs or extracurricular sure. activities. I mean, which are things that people would generally say teachers are expected to do, but no, that's actually not the case. Like, I mean, teachers don't get like, that's not part of their salary no, no. Uh, and expect and job expectations to, um, to, to be coaches on teams. In fact, uh, in Ontario, um, what typically happens when there's work um, issues, when there's labor issues is um, the uh, uh, the government, Ontario government, will tend to force teachers back to work almost right away. Like they'll legislate it, uh, pass a law. Uh, teachers are an essential service. They they can't go on strike. They're not allowed to go on strike, which is you know stupid and ridiculous. But it is what it is. So that all that usually happens instantly, like even before a strike is enacted. Yeah. Um, but then but then the only um, outcome that that teachers have at that point is doing what they call work to rule yeah. in Ontario, which is basically only doing exactly what you what are the contract supposed states. to be doing, exactly. which is literally teaching in the classroom and grading assignments and, and doing report cards. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you'll have teachers that do bare minimum of report card stuff even. Um, so, I mean, and I'll tell you, there's been an unfortunate casualty uh, of this, this, kind of labor issue and and we're not going to get into the weeds on it um but i think because of our close relationship with um our our good friend noah geisel um who is the president of the ccflt uh colorado congress of foreign Foreign language language teachers teachers. oh i nailed that nice uh they have a conference and um it was happening right now well Yesterday, I think, and Friday. And um, so what happened is the Denver Public School Board, which, you know, is obviously huge and definitely the largest school board in Denver or in Colorado. In Colorado by far. Yep. Uh, by far. Um, told all of its teachers you could not attend this conference. Uh, they they were not permitted to attend it. Uh, and not um, not allowed to be present. There were presenters scheduled to present yes. that were members of DPS. 
um, and they weren't allowed to either. And, um, you know, it's complicated. I get it. It's also completely ridiculous. And, um, well, the CCFLT wouldn't want to frame it as any sort of, um, you know, tit for tat type situation. Uh, I don't mind kind of suggesting that it might be. And, uh, I mean, I think that this is a really unfortunate thing to do to teachers who are looking to grow and develop and, and learn and learn from each other and teach each other and to say, you can't come and do that. Um, it's it's a reminder that labor issues aren't always unfortunately about the students and sometimes have you know the students and teachers end up being the you know the pawns in things related to governments and money and and stuff like that it's this is a really really crappy thing to do to a bunch of really passionate listen if you're a member of a organization that is strictly devoted and gives their entire like free time to foreign language teaching and developing foreign language teachers you're pretty passionate about this and you know to then go and screw those people because of a uh almost like a retribution type thing this is pretty 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 dirty right yeah and it was i think it was really sad too and and really petty um these teachers, a bunch of them paid out out of their own pocket for this conference. Yep. And now they can't attend. And a bunch of them uh, from other school districts are coming to this conference to go listen to some specific sessions. And and the people that are presenting are in Denver public schools. They can't actually present their session. Yep. So then the entire conference is basically thrown into – you know, chaos, you know, 48 hours before yep. they're about to go ahead and go on the show. You know, it's not like it happened before. It just says, hey, you know, the the strike is looming. Sorry, you guys can't go. You can't attend this. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. And that's just ridiculous. I mean, for a variety of different reasons. Number one, these people are passionate about their profession. Yeah. Talk about professionals. You're going out and you're either A, presenting or B, presenting and attending or attending a session so that you become a better teacher. There's nothing better than that. I mean, that's that's what we all want from our teachers. You know, as we call them professionals, we want them to go ahead and continue to grow and want to be passionate about what they do and continue to learn the latest pedagogy, whatever it might be that they're that they're going after. And you can't attend the session and you can't attend the conference uh, because of a contract dispute. I mean, it's a it's a bad situation. I, you know, in the name of uh, making lemonade out of lemons, uh, there has been a bit of a, a I wouldn't call it a movement yet, but certainly a conversation has been sparked uh, surrounding PD. And we do want to share the hashtag on Twitter, uh, I guess, hashtag liberate PD. Um, if you're interested in hearing uh, what happened specifically with uh, CCFLT uh, and and what's going on in Denver, but also kind of join in this conversation about what we do surrounding PD in general, I think that that might be a, a good place to start. So again, that's um, liberate PD is the hashtag on Twitter, and, and that might be uh, an interesting place to start. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about this super interesting article on Ed Surge um, that kind of talks about what schools look like today and and schools and how they're going to look like in the future and what we're doing, you know, to adjust and to accommodate new changes uh, going forward. Quests. One of Classcraft's most popular features with over 100,000 lessons created by teachers and 3 million learning objectives completed by students so far is now part of Classcraft's free offerings. In 2019, your students won't just be learning multiplication, chemistry, or any other content. They'll be saving the kingdom. Transform your lessons into adventures with Quest today. Visit Classcraft.com for more information. All right, welcome back to the podcast. Super interesting article came out in Ed Surge a couple of days ago. Uh, in the future, today's education will look like 19th century medicine. It was uh, actually, I think, a speech, a, a talk that um, Jeffrey C. Riley gave at a conference called Learn Launch. 
uh, in Boston, and it was kind of um, documented uh, in in Ed Search, and it was it, there was tons of interesting things in in this uh, this article and in this speech. Um, you brought it up, Glenn. So, what did you think was super interesting to begin with? Um, I I think once you go ahead and take a look at it, the part that really was striking, and anybody that teaches in the United States knows this, is that there's a quote here basically that says. Uh, the big secret in public education is that teacher quality, the variation in teacher quality is huge. And mm-hmm. so, and, and how does that actually happen? Well, it happens because each individual state is so different than each other as far as teacher yeah. training is concerned and continued professional development is concerned. But not only that, Mike, but each individual district within the state has a huge variance in, in what do they actually do for professional development? How much time do they actually give? How good is the professional development? And so you have this huge variation between amazing districts that are doing great things because their teachers are receiving the correct professional development. They're growing in the profession, their passion, and they're moving forward. And then you have the exact opposite, which is districts that have little or no professional development or what they call professional development isn't really anything that's that's making uh, uh, differences. Um, and a lot of this stuff always goes back to, as we always talk about, uh, you know, the big standardized testing and whether or not the focus on that versus just good teaching, uh, you know, and the battle between those two types of things. But that was one of the things that I saw in there right away that I was like, okay, that is so accurate and so telling about why education is so different in all of our states and even within our states, all of our different districts. As as much as you and I and, you know, all of our kind of circle interact on Twitter constantly and are sharing constantly, the reality is there's 8 million teachers in North America. Hardly any of them are on Twitter. Hardly yeah. any of them are learning from each other and teaching each other and working with each other as much n- noise and, and conversations are out there on Twitter. And, you know, I could show you a video of my tweet deck and how fast it moves. It's like, boom, 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 boom. And, and I'm, I don't have, I have like a third of the followers of even you, Glenn. And, and I mean, we see these conversations happening and we think, wow, look at all of this engagement. But the reality is that there are, and he references this, where teachers aren't communicating, they aren't sharing, they, so and they're true. not gi- they're not given the structure to do that either. No, they're not given the opportunities and the time and the space, and you know, and then we literally just had a conversation about Denver Public Schools stopping teachers from coming to a conference. I know, and and I mean. It, it, there's missed opportunities all over the place. Uh, it's why we're doing this damn podcast. I, I know. mean, for it's totally so it. that we have another reason, another way of people learning and sharing and communicating. We want people to talk to each other, and um, the time and the space is just not being um, given um, to to have teachers participate in professional learning communities. This whole article was super interesting and and it really reinforced a lot of super interesting ideas that we've talked about in the past one of the other things that was interesting about this was a story that um he told about a sale a fundraising sale um and that uh, there was a complaint from a woman and and she was complaining uh, and he said well i mean People have candy sales all over the place. This is a kind of a normal thing. She said, I'm not complaining about the candy. The candy's fine. I'm complaining about the price. And he still doesn't get it. He's like, okay. I mean, it was a dollar. Yeah. Everyone has a dollar. <laughs> uh, and and she says, it's not a dollar, man. They're selling them for five. What was happening was the kids were marking up the candy. Yeah. They, they were trying to they were trying to sell it <laughs> for a profit, which I I can get behind that all day. I think it's hilarious. I I laughed um, 
very loudly when I read that part because I thought it was hysterical and it, it reminded me that, you know, we need to give even kids the space to, to be creative. And um, we had that interesting conversation. Remind me of that interesting conversation we had um, a few months ago about the student who got in trouble who, yep, and is still hacking. going through these issues with the hacking and how, I mean, was this really something that the student needed to be punished for? Or is it something where we needed to then channel that student's passions and interests into, into other more, more productive things with those abilities. Yeah. And it's like, we just, teachable moments. it was an absolutely teachable moment and we need to continue to find those. And so this is a great example of finding teachable moments and, and pointing them out. Um, and then building on them and Absolutely. the idea that the idea that in the future, you know, we can be a little more precise with these things, I think, is the, the point of the article that we're trying to sometimes we want to take a, a cudgel to the education system. Yes. But in reality, we could use a scalpel, right? Yes. No, I mean, that's exactly right. It's it's uh, it, it'll be just interesting. And I think it's already interesting for us to just take a look back at uh, it reminds me of that uh, Twitter post that you made that uh, about looking back at uh, smart boards and, okay. and then seeing that seeing the practice of that, Mike, even though that was just seven to 10 years ago and going, God, we we really could have done something way better than that. Right. But magnify yeah. that times a million and say, hey, what are we actually doing in our schools today? And then looking back you know, 25 years from now, 20, 30 years from now and going, man, we should have done so many different things. We had the opportunity to do them. We just, just were stuck in our ways, you know, didn't want to go ahead and push beyond uh, what we were comfortable with. I guess that's kind of what, what I would say and kind of like what's always been done as, as we had said in the last segment. So, I mean, there's, there's tons, what I took away from this article was that there's tons of opportunity. There's always opportunities to get better and to learn and to grow and to improve our system and the way we teach people. We just spent 15, 20 minutes talking about it in the previous segment about what to do with grades and standardized testing. And so there's a lot of room here. And I, I mean, the more our current system looks archaic. Yes. In the future makes me feel better i mean i'm hoping that our system grow, right huh? now looks like a mess we're like what the hell were we doing <laughs> oh right? man no it's so true and you're so right about though we feel like there's this certain momentum happening because uh, we're within a group you know of yeah. people who all are super passionate about being a driving force in education the reality is that this is a, a minuscule part of the overall number of people out there, you know, of our of our fellow educators who are also on that same train, you know, and, and on it and heading in that direction. And we need to make sure we we let them know about it. Hey, come and join us and check this out. Check out the things that are actually happening and all these great things that are going to make us all better teachers, make the education systems that much better. Awesome. Totally. So speaking of great things, yeah. uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to be joined by Jennifer Lagarde. She's the author, uh, co-author of the book Fact versus Fiction, published by ISTE. All right, welcome back to the podcast, everyone. We're thrilled to be joined uh, today by Jennifer Lagarde. Jennifer is the co-author of uh, a new book called Fact versus Fiction, published by ISTE. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Jennifer. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Jennifer, can you tell us uh, a little bit about who you are, what you do, where you're from, kind of the Jennifer Lagarde 101, if you will? Sure. Well, uh, I've been an educator for, gosh, more years than I care to admit at this point. Um, but I started out my career as a middle school language arts teacher and sort of wended my way into a school library media position, which is where I think I found my true calling in helping teachers and students use technology, um, especially for literacy-rich instruction. 
And from there, I went to work for the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction as um, what they called their librarian on loan. That is to say, I supported all the librarians in the state of North Carolina through PD and that kind of thing. And then two years ago, I moved all the way across the country to Olympia, Washington, where I now serve as a consultant for the Evergreen Public School District and then also um, for other school districts around the country. But my primary work is with Evergreen School District here in Vancouver, Washington. So that's kind of my professional story. But really yes. and truly, I just consider myself a teacher still and love working with learners of all ages. Awesome. Um, so let's get right into this this book here. Um how big of a problem is this? I, I guess as someone who has, I, I mean, I am a, a very passionate person about word precision. Mm -hmm. I, I joke and, and I joke all the time that I'm the guy that always makes a note of things. There's a difference, for example, between socialism and social democracy mm -hmm. and democratic socialism. Those three aren't the same thing. people. Right. Anyways, um, <laughs> but so I'm big on word precision. I'm big on people just using the right words in the right situations. Yeah. And fake news seems to be a pretty catastrophic problem to me. A am I overreacting or is this really the beginning of the end? Because, uh, I mean, people uh, are people can you identify facts or <laughs> are they unwilling to even acknowledge facts? Oh my gosh, that's a big question. And am I losing my mind? Is no, really the question you're not. Here, you're probably. not losing your mind. Although <laughs> I would um, fall a little bit shy of thinking that we're all doomed. That it's like there's no point in working towards a solution to this problem because the problem is pretty catastrophic. You're right about that. I think it's a huge problem that's gotten away from us. But I do think that we have the ability to right the ship. I do think that we have the tools and the skills. Um, to bring back, put the toothpaste, tooth, toothpaste back in the tube, metaphorically speaking, mm -hmm. or at least um, provide those kids that we work with now with skills that so many in our generation seem unwilling to use. Um, it is huge. It is a huge problem. In the book, we talk a lot about all the data out there surrounding the top news stories that have been shared on various social new networks since the run up to the presidential election and other sources of um, data around Americans inability to determine fact from fiction in online settings. And those, all of that data can make you feel very, very hopeless. Um, but I think there's a, I think it's a combination of things really. I think it's a matter of number one, I think we haven't focused on this very greatly in schools in a way that reflects how people really research and consume information in their real lives. So the, the skills that we teach in schools don't often translate to what we do in our real lives. And then number two, we're also entrenched in our own biases now mm. that really it's about a change in mindset. It's a change in, it's a, deci a decision, a constant decision that we don't want to live here, live like this anymore that we want to live differently, that we want a different country, we want a different way of talking to each other online, et cetera. And so we have to make the decision to do things differently. If we want a different result, we have to do things a little differently. Love this. It's it's it, we're, we're dealing with an issue with an unmovable object versus an unstoppable force kind of thing. And people are definitely operating in their own little worlds these days and, and unwilling to. There's a great part in the book, actually, where you talk about how someone says and you hear this all the time now no matter what you say nothing's going to change my mind right it's yeah and one of the things we felt very strongly about doing in the book is not simply just saying look this is a massive problem um now have fun dealing with it but <laughs> really we wanted to create a sense of urgency around the problem for educators yeah. and then also provide them with some resources for dealing with it and one of the resources i think that we um, sometimes skip over is the ability to just have conversation with another person around an issue that might trigger um, some deeply entrenched beliefs. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a skill set that we all need to develop because I'm guilty of it too. You know, I'll be online and somebody will say something that um, sparks a passionate reaction in me. And my initial response is either to, you know, 
smack them down with some sarcasm or to block them block you know that's and we have to sit we have to step back and think about what's the more productive way to handle this and what are some what's some phrasing that we can use when we have conversations around these issues that can hopefully lead us to a a place of commonality because we do have more in common um, than we think sometimes. And that's the more productive approach. We've sort of lost that ability. One thing I do find that we all have in common because I travel around the country Talk not just talking about the book, but teaching workshops on media literacy in sort of a mobile age. And no matter where I am in the country, no matter what the political leanings are of that space, one thing that we can all agree on is that we've reached an all-time low when it comes to our ability to talk to one another. And so if we can start That's from true. that place of... We have that in common. Let's start with some skills um, so that we can be better at that. And then let's try applying those um, to the conversations that are harder. So speaking of all time lows, I I love your history lesson at the start of the book. Uh, I'm I'm a history major and I actually took a propaganda elective uh, Mm -hmm. during my, my undergrad uh, I studied a lot about British propaganda during World War One and World War Two, and how that uh, affected things. Uh, and there are so many other awesome stories about fake news in history. Right. I think about things like the Spanish American War and, and 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 tons of yellow journalism type stories as well. This this isn't a new thing, right? right. No, not at all. And Darren, uh, my co-author, was a history major as well. And so that chapter for him was a huge, like, we had to really pare it down from being 300 pages <laughs> to um, what you see today, because there are Funny. so many examples. And that has really been one of the most fun chapters for me, seeing people's reaction, because I have gotten tweets from people saying things like, oh, my gosh, you've ruined Ben Franklin for me for the rest of my life. You know, that kind of stuff. People are... Uh, sort of shocked when they learn some of those stories. But it's important for us to recognize that for as long as there's been a media and as long as there's been a populace, people have used the former to try to manipulate the latter. The difference is now that the technology makes it so much more scalable. So now you can do that in a way that is so much faster and affects so many more people. Whereas when we look at the stories in the book, you know, it took months and months and months for some of those um, efforts to take root. Whereas now Mm -hmm. it takes a millisecond. You yeah. know, one viral video, boom, we're done. Um, so it's the technology that isn't, the technology is not the problem. The technology is just made the problem um, more scalable. It's exacerbated it. It's an amplifier. That's a great quote. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it, I mean, even the, just to, to be totally um, relevant in terms of timeliness, this this video of um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez that's that was shared on Thursday yes. already has like 60 million views. I mean, it's just it's everywhere now. Right. It does not take long at all anymore for things to to spread. So and I'm going to jump go right ahead. and just say really quickly that yeah. it, I think that the speed at which something spreads should automatically be a red flag for us. We discussed some research so in the uh, book about the speed at which information that is false spreads is like six times faster than information that is true. And so the more quickly we see things spreading throughout our network, I think that should be a red flag for us to step back and think, let's wait till the whole story emerges. Because the initial report often is just, if not false, at least um, limited in terms of being told from one viewpoint. And when we spread out and see the bigger view of whatever the issue is, oftentimes the narrative changes in um, a more accurate way. So the, the more quickly our Uncle Lenny has a hold of something, that should just be a red flag to us that, okay, let's wait. Let's just take a breath. It's okay to not repost this on the very first day when it happens. It, in fact, it's better to share it a couple of days later when we have all of the information. Totally. Um, I remember watching, I think it was Face the Nation, <clears throat> when Kellyanne Conway uh, was being interviewed. This was right at the very start uh, mm-hmm. of, of the administration. And, and she said the words alternative mm-hmm. facts. And I, 
I watched it again this morning. I actually watched it a couple of times because I you wanted to be able to like. Punishment. <laughs> well, but the the look on her face. I was yeah. saying this to so my true. wife this morning. The look on her face mm-hmm. when she said it, she knew that what she was saying was just absolutely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Like she knew that she was about to like the words were she couldn't stop the words from coming out of her mouth, but she wished she could. Right. That's the way the look on her face looked like. And that's when I knew that this was a mess. And I think maybe I was a little bit late to the game. I, I'm curious if you have a time in this last, you know, gong show that's been three or four years, I guess now, uh, when you knew that this was bad. Well, I think Darren and I, I, I can't pinpoint an exact date, but what I can say is that incidents like that, yeah. um, but also coupled with, because Darren and I are connected educators. Most of the people in our networks are uh, fellow educators. And what we kept seeing in, you know, gosh, since I'm just going to say back to the middle of, say, 2015, was so so many of the people in our network were sharing information that was so easily debunked. And we found this so frustrating because we're connected with educators. It's not just, you know, the people we went to high school with or people that um, we're related to, distant cousins or whatever. We're connected with educators. And so he and I first just kept saying, God, like, talked about how weary we were of being one, having to constantly step in and say, you know, this has actually been proven false. You know, this is actually not true, et cetera. Then you couple that with incidents like the alternative facts and the constant bombardment of just the term fake news. Mm -hmm. Um, When fake news was added to the dictionary, which I want to say was in 2017, at that point they cited like a 365% increase in the use of that term since the year prior. And what happened is, in our estimation, is that it becomes then not only a really lazy term for a lot of other more specific issues that might be housed within a specific story, but also it just became a really easy way to discredit those people that you don't agree with. If I don't agree with something you're saying, then I'm just going to hashtag it fake news. That's it. Right. You know, Um, so (laughs) I, we, all of those things, I think for Darren and I just came to a boiling point around, um, the beginning of 2017 and where we just said, well, instead of continuing to complain about this, what are we going to do about it? You know, like what can we do to try to affect it? And that's how the book was born for us. So Jennifer, we were thinking there's not actually an official like guide on how to teach this. And your writing suggests that only about 7% of schools have learning objectives related to fake news. And most teachers are just making up the curriculum themselves have you been able to identify the reason for this disconnect? Well, I think it's a like a lot of things. It's a combination. It's a complex issue, so it's a combination of things. I think one um, very important aspect of that is that in American schools, we're still very much driven by standardized tests that focus on basic English and math skills. And so so those things are not tested. So therefore, we don't spend a lot of time on them. Also, because there isn't an adopted curricula around media literacy in most states, um, teachers are left sort of to their own devices. And what often happens is that um, one teacher in particular is tasked with, okay, we have to, if our district has decided we're going to prioritize media literacy, then we'll ask one teacher in the sixth grade to make sure that they go through X number of modules with kids and then boom, we're done. I see this in a lot of um, schools where they have been able to check off the media literacy box, 
by putting kids in front of computers to do several online lessons in one particular grade. And then when that's checked off, they feel like media literacy is complete. Like that's yeah, their, like they've done their, done. their due diligence, right? Yeah. Um, because there are some states, my home state of Washington um, certainly is one, California is one, where th- there's starting to be some traction in the idea that this is something that needs to be taught in school, but the how of it has not been provided or the resources um, to schools. So schools are scrambling to do that. What we have found is that um, it it takes a teacher or a group of teachers who feel a sense of urgency around the issue to embed it within their existing curriculum in a way that not only makes sense for them in the teaching that they're already doing, but also makes it more meaningful for kids. Um, and relevant as opposed to here's our six lessons. And then once we're done, that's it. So it seems to me that you're actually making up for this shortfall a little bit in the book. We talked before we went on air about all the resources in the book. And, and, and I, I I did crack a little bit of a joke about the QR codes. Mm -hmm. Um, But to be honest, there's a ton of stuff in the book, a lot of great resources and ideas that teachers can use built right into here you could buy this and almost you know help it guide you in terms of you know bridging that gap and creating a curriculum so that you're you're you are touching on all the right things was that kind of the goal with the book well, yeah, we felt very strongly about making the book actionable. Um, we didn't just want to have a situation in which we uh, outlined a huge problem for teachers and then said, you know, good luck, have fun with it. You know, we wanted to provide educators, whether they're a school librarian or a classroom teacher or a principal, whatever their role is, to be able to take back the very next day and start working on implementation. We wanted to make it practical practical and actionable, um, which is why we joked before we went on air about all the QR codes, because, you know, uh, I think sometimes that I travel around to a lot of schools and see technology in use on the front lines with kids every day. And the technology um, has often not caught up in the school to the way we think um, it should be. Those of us who are outside of schools talking about where education should be, et cetera. And a classroom teacher might be, you know, trying to hobble together a lesson on media literacy was just you know, one or two iPads in the classroom or um, one desktop or a couple of Chromebooks. And we wanted to present those resources in a way that that teacher could just quickly scan one and have the resource ready and available for their kids. So we tried very hard to make it about what would be the easiest for educators to implement right away in their building. But I also want to say that what else was important to us was that we um, focused a great deal on what how what information looks like and how we determine credibility and authority in a mobile environment as opposed to just on a desktop or a laptop because that is where most of us actually do our real research where we interact with most information is on our phones or on our tablets and it's even more true for the kids we teach and it's you know it's a lot harder to determine authority on a news article that you found in Snapchat than whether on one that you're looking <laughs> up on your desktop and we learned through our research that apps like Snapchat are really very popular news sources for our kids our kids follow news providers on the apps that they use the most. And how do they determine credibility in those environments? If we're not teaching them those skills in schools, then all, the amount of time that we spend on media literacy in the classroom is kind of wasted when it doesn't apply, when they pull out their phone, when they get home. That's so true. And so what we're wondering is how can our listeners get fact versus fiction Jennifer, and where can people connect with you? Okay, well, um, Fact versus Fiction is available anywhere that books are sold. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it at Barnes & Noble, etc. And if if you're an ISTE member, you can buy it at the ISTE website for a discount. So that's always a good resource. And as far as connecting with me goes, you can't really escape me. I am all over (laughs) social media. Um, at Jennifer Lagarde is my handle everywhere. Real creative, I know. And But you can also find me on my uh, website, which is www.librarygirl.net. Very cool. 
Awesome, Jennifer. Thanks for joining us today. This was fantastic. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Mike Washburn. My co-host is Glenn Irvin. Want to get in touch with us? Check out our website at oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Glenn is at Irv Spanish on Twitter. I can be found on Twitter at Mr. Washburn. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we'd love if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast or Google Play Store. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost and this helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Schoology, for supporting us. Check out Schoology.com to learn how they can help you advance what's possible. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome and we'll see you soon.